BI 13. The Separation. The Process Church of the Final Judgment. London. April 1969. Communication to all brethren, information. Brethren, as it is. The separation is within the dimension of time. In time there is that which is of God and that which is not of God. There is negative and positive, evil and good, sin and virtue, salvation and damnation. There is division, and from the initial division of God and godlessness, the springs the fragmentation of all things, and the scattering of all the parts of one, throughout the universe of time and space. God is divided and divided and divided, until it is stretched from one end of eternity to the other. But without time there is no separation. Ultimately there is no division. There is no right and wrong, or good and evil. The burden of time is the conflict of the division. And this is our burden. We embody the whole separation, from one extreme to the other. We must, otherwise the parts cannot be brought together. We are stretched across the whole span of the universe. We are at the pinnacle of heaven, and in the deepest depths of hell. We are totally good, and at the same time totally bad. We are wholly of God, and we are wholly not of God. We manifest the ultimate of all things, both negative and positive. And our function is to separate, to raise up that which, within time, is of God, and to condemn that which, within time, is not of God, to create godliness, and to destroy godlessness, at the same time manifesting both within ourselves. And within time, that is as it is, divided. But beyond time, everything is a part of God, not of God divided, but of God united, resolved, and brought together into one. Within time, there is an eternity of agony for all beings not of God. But when time is no more, eternity is no more, the separation is no more. There is no condemnation, because there is no division. There is no damnation, because there is no separation. But until time is resolved, and all is brought together, we must bear its burden to the ultimate. We must span the scale from the highest to the lowest. We must feel the greatest joy, and the greatest agony. We must embrace the ultimate salvation, and the ultimate damnation. We must be the very best, and the very worst. We must hate, and we must love. We must know perfection, and degradation. And we must know the separation, in all its stark and unequivocal intensity. Before it can be transcended, it must be known and felt, and experienced, to the ultimate. Black must be the ultimate black, and white the ultimate white, and we must feel and know them both. For again, there must be separation, before there can be no separation. There must be the ultimate intensity of conflict, before there can be no conflict. The two ends of the universe must be disentangled, before they can be reunited, distinguished, before they can be identified. If we are clinging desperately and fearfully to something, terrified that at any moment it might be torn from our grasp, then we cannot be truly united with it, until we have first been separated from it, or more accurately, until we have seen that in reality we already are separated from it, by the barrier of our compulsive attachment to it, and until we have seen the true extent of our separation. Because knowledge and awareness are always the only essentials when it comes to action. To see and to know, are all we are required to do of our own volition. From there we are free to follow, as far as we can, our instincts and our inclinations, to exercise our illusion of choice, according to our own judgment, and the signs that are there to guide us. However choiceless we may consciously know ourselves to be, until that knowledge has become a true and deeply founded awareness, both conscious and unconscious, there is still the illusion of choice, a basic sense of personal control of our destiny, a sense of individual responsibility. And as long as that is there, we must enact it and attempt to fulfill it. That, ironically, is a part of our choicelessness, as is the fact that we shall inevitably fail.
If we demand something compulsively of ourselves, we fail to achieve it. And the reason is based upon the fact of choicelessness, and upon the myth, the fallacy, the illusion, that choice exists at all. And here is the logic of choicelessness. If you create something from nothing, or, more precisely, from a part of yourself, then whatever that creation does or is, stems from the nature of its creation. If it behaves in a particular way, manifests a particular characteristic that must be a direct and logical outcome of the way it has been designed and programmed. In the face of external pressures and circumstances, the response of the creation, which is what matters, stems directly from the nature of its existence, and therefore from the way it has been created. But when we speak of creations, we include a factor which contradicts this logic. We include the concept of personal choice. We say that a human being, which is a creation of God, has a will of its own which is independent of its creator. And God, by its condemnation of its creation, on account of its misuse of its power of choice, endorses this. But this is disownership of the creation. This is saying that what the creation does stems not from the nature of its creation, but from some independent element, peculiar to the creation, but having no connection with the creator. So by deciding that a creation has a personal choice of its own, independent of the creator, the creator disowns the creation. He rejects it. He says, their creation is not wholly mine. It has an existence of its own, which is separate from me. I am not responsible for the way it chooses to be. He then demands that the creation exercise the element of choice in one particular direction. He demands obedience. Now he has already rejected his creation, by maintaining that it has choice and a will of its own, separate from him. By the universal law, his creation must in turn reject him. And its only method is disobedience. Reject and you must be rejected in return. So the creation disobeys. It must, in order to fulfill the law. It quite deliberately fails to meet the demand which the Creator makes upon it. And the irony is this, it has no choice. It is subject to the universal law, and therefore cannot do otherwise, but reject its Creator, who has rejected it. So the choice was an illusion, a myth, a fantasy, both for the creation, which really believed it had choice. It felt the power to choose, to decide, to control its destiny, and for the Creator, who equally felt his creation's power to choose. But it was a lie. Choice does not exist. Every creation in the universe, on every level, is subject to the universal law, which controls everything the creation manifests, and is inevitable. A man has no more choice than an amoeba. But why then the lie? Why the illusion? What is it for? The answer is, the game. The illusion of choice is for the game. The game is conflict, creating and destroying, building and demolishing, separating and coming together, rising and falling, disintegrating and reuniting, failing and succeeding, living and dying, winning and losing, loving and hating. That is the game, and the game is the essence of existence. But without the lie, without the illusion of choice, which is the illusion of conflict, which is the root of striving and reaching and hoping, which is the driving force of movement and change and growth and development, without the fantasy of a creation's control over its own destiny, there is no game, only a static motionless perfection. For a game there must be conflict, for conflict there must be choice, for choice there must be rejection. For rejection there must be disownership, for disownership there must be creation and separation. That is the start of the cycle. Then the cycle must be played out. There is no returning except by completing. The full circle of the game must be traversed, rejection by rejection by rejection. And because to create, and then give choice to the creation, is the prime method of rejection, this is the pattern of the game. A cycle of creation and sub-creation. The creator creates, and rejects. The rejected creation, in order to fulfill the law, becomes a creator, and it creates and rejects. 
and the creation's s creation also creates, and rejects. And so the cycle continues, separation on separation on separation. And each of us, on his level of existence, has been created and rejected, and subsequently each of us has created and rejected. Demands are made upon us by our creators, demands that we feel within our bones and therefore make upon ourselves, demands that inevitably we fail to meet. And because we reject by such failure, our creators reject us the more, separating us ever further from knowledge of them, from contact with them, from their love and their security. So we, in our turn, must equally add to our own rejection, through disobedience and failure, and so the spiral downwards into death continues. And at the same time, we make demands upon our creations, instilling in them a sense of their own personal responsibility, and thereby forcing them to fail in order to reject. And as long as we pass responsibility downwards, as long as we demand of those below us, demands will be made upon us from above. Responsibility will continue to go down the line, choice will continue to be meaningful to us, whatever we might consciously know to the contrary. By the universal law, as long as we demand from below, it shall be demanded of us from above. As long as we reject by demanding, we shall be rejected. But we do demand. We demand by desiring, by needing. And there are more demands to be made, more burdens to be carried, more failure, more disappointment, and more rejection, before the cycle is complete, and the illusion of choice is taken away. Pain is conflict. Conflict is choice. Choice is the lie by which the game is played. And there is more of the game to be played out before the completion. We are carrying the burden of choice, which is no less real as a burden for being an illusion. For us the illusion is still reality, and until we are ready to be freed of the burden, until the time comes for the burden to be lifted, and for us to fall back into the perfect security of total choicelessness, we shall continue to feel the weight of personal responsibility. We shall continue to feel the need to place the burden upon ourselves and one another. We shall continue to feel the urge to blame ourselves and one another. We shall continue to want to strive amongst ourselves, despite what we cannot help but know. For that is the game. But if we know that the pain we feel, whether it is mental or physical, is only a fraction of the pain which the gods themselves must suffer, to conclude the game according to the law, if we know that whatever our burdens, theirs are a hundred times greater and more agonizing to bear, then we can endure with a greater sense of purpose and worthwhileness, then we can find some light of truth in the darkness of the lie. And if, beside the pain we feel, we hold a separate and independent knowledge of the final lifting of the burdens from our shoulders, if we know our choicelessness, and still enact the choice, without confusing the two and becoming submerged in our fear of alienation, then we can derive an added strength, and a basic reassurance and security, from the faith inherent in this distinction. The mind thinks, whilst the soul both knows and feels. But within the game, knowing and feeling are divided, separated from one another by the conflict of the thinking mind. So that what we know, is not always what we feel. We know truth, but we feel a lie. We know love, but we feel hatred. We know that ultimately there is life, but we feel the all-pervasive presence of death. We know the unity, but we feel the separation. We know God, but we feel the pressures and effects of godlessness. We know the ultimate goal of perfection, but we feel submerged in irrevocable imperfection. We know heaven, but we feel the restrictions and the horrors of hell. We know harmony exists in all things, but we feel ourselves and all existence torn apart by seemingly interminable strife. And we know that one day we shall no longer be divided within ourselves or from one another, and then we shall know what we feel, and feel what we know, and our souls shall be one. The conflict of the mind is an intellectual contortion that breeds doubt and misgiving. The resulting conflict of the soul, itself divided by the mind's dichotomy, is a searing agony of twisted contradiction. It is the universe stretched across eternity and nailed in place 
helpless and impotent upon the rack of time. It is the crucifixion of the core of life. And each one of us embodies his share of the pain. So do not feel alone, nor that even one moment of suffering is without purpose. The debt is exact, and every grain of agony is counted towards its repayment. And the cycle is drawing to its inevitable close. And although the feelings of pain are in many ways intensified, yet equally the knowledge of choicelessness and ultimate freedom from the burdens of expiation, expands within us, giving us greater faith and greater powers of endurance. And as long as we feel the present, live within it, understand it, embrace it, accept it as part of ourselves, and can rise above it, then we may know the future, see it in the distance, imagine it for ourselves, not as something to be striven towards, grasped for, hoped for, reached for, prayed for or even worked for, but as something that must be, a time that must come to us when the task is finished. We do not aim at the freedom and joy of the future. We only aim at what seems to be the best permutation for the present. The future is something we know. It already exists, prepared for us. And sooner or later, according to the will of God, it will cease to be future and become present. Then we shall know and feel as one. Then we shall rest in the fulfillment of an undivided soul. Then we shall find peace in a minute no longer torn by conflict. Then we shall receive as we desire to receive, and give as we desire to give. Then we shall know what we want, not only by what we have, but also by what we feel we want. Then the spark of pure consciousness shall rule within each of us, instead of being subject to the anachronism of a divided unconsciousness. Then we shall be where we feel we belong. Then we shall do what we feel inclined to do. Then we shall be what we feel the desire to be. Then we shall have what we feel we want to have. Then we shall love and be loved, give and be given to, know and be known, receive and be received, accept and be accepted, without the pain of conflict and frustration. Know that future time. Do not grasp for it, that will only intensify the pain of now. But know it, see it believe in it. For it is the fulfillment of the divine will. So be it. Robert. Robert de Grimston.